Should you be worried about toxic herbicide residue in manures? Today I'm going to be talking about if you should be worried, what you should be worrying about, and a simple test to tell whether that worry is justified or not. Let's get into it. Over the past few weeks since my first Manure Mania video, I've received tons of comments asking about persistent herbicides in manures. They range from paranoia to very justified concerns. So should you be concerned? Should you be paranoid about manure? Yes, you should be worried about the presence of persistent herbicides in manure. That doesn't mean that they are there, but it means that they could be there. And if they are there, that's a problem. And the TLDR version of this video is if you are at all worried about the presence of persistent herbicides in manure, don't use that manure. So should you be worried? Yes, you should, and here's why. The very first reason is this isn't some dirty little hidden secret. The chemical companies realize that these products could be a problem if they're misused. They're not trying to hide that at all. It says right in their literature, there are issues if you don't handle them in the way that we suggest that you handle them. So if somebody just applies this to a hay field, harvests that hay, and sends it off to market, and you buy that hay, well, now you more than likely have that persistent herbicide on your property. Companies like Corteva are advising against that, so don't blame the companies for the misuse of the user. So while the chemical companies are creating these products, it's really the end consumers that might be misusing the product and getting it into the waste stream, which might end up in your compost and in your garden. So let's learn a little bit about these persistent herbicides. One of the most common persistent herbicides out there, and it's one that's been mentioned a lot in the comments, is aminopyrrolid. Aminopyrrolid is a chemical that provides systemic control of target species with good tolerance of cool and warm season grasses. They're a post-emergent herbicide that controls the entire plant, including roots, and offers soil residual activity to extend control. So here you have a product designed to control broadleaf plants, and it's designed to have soil residual activity in place. So if some of it hits the soil, there's a plant there, the plant can't grow on that soil because the herbicide is remaining there. Here's what one manufacturer of aminopyrrolid has to say. Manure and urine from animals consuming grass or hay treated with this product may contain enough aminopyrrolid to cause injury to sensitive broadleaf plants. Do not use hay or straw from areas treated with aminopyrrolid or manure from animals feeding on hay treated with aminopyrrolid in compost. So the maker knows that persistency of these chemicals can be an issue downstream and they are advising end users of these chemicals to please take heed of these warnings. Use them as they are directed. At the end of the day, they want the product to be used in a controlled manner in one place and they're trying to limit the extent of exposure of that product to the place where it was actually applied. They don't want it migrating somewhere else. And it's pretty remarkable when you think about this that the manure in urine coming out of an animal that grazed on plants that ha had this chemical applied to them can then transfer that chemical to a different location. All of the herbicides that we're talking about here can be classified in a group called growth regulating herbicides. A study published at Virginia Tech states, quote, the most persistent growth regulator herbicides are in the pyridine and pyrimidine groups. These chemicals can potentially cause injury to susceptible crops six months or more after application. The waiting period before planting certain sensitive broadleaf crops in a field treated with clopyrrolid can be as long as 18 months. These herbicides retain their activity even after composting. This is why growth regulator herbicides in the pyridine group are of the greatest concern to growers worried about herbicide residue as garden amendments and straw or grass mulch. If you look at this chart, you can see the half-life range in days of various persistent herbicides. With half-lives ranging from one to over 400 days, you can see how these herbicides can become a problem by hanging around. Remember, the half-life is the time required for half of the compound to degrade. So after one half-life, 
it's 50% degraded after two half-lives, it's 75% degraded, and after five half-lives, it's 97% degraded. So think about a compound that has a half-life of, say, 300 days. You need to go 300 days times five, 1,500 days, to get 97% degradation. These things don't break down quickly in all conditions. So with aminopyrrolid, the half-life ranges from 32 to 533 days with a typical time of 103 days. If you think about this five half-life principle to get 97% plus degradation, that's a long time potentially to have it break down that much. Why is this half-life even so important? It's so important because these chemicals are so potent and powerful even at very, very small concentrations. Well, how small can they even be potent at? Very small. Here's how. Aminopyrrolid has proven to be the hardest compound to detect as it is used in very low quantities and can harm plants at levels below one part per billion. One part per billion, what does that actually mean? Give me some examples. One part per billion is equivalent to a drop of ink in a 13,000 gallon tanker truck. It's equivalent to one car in a line of cars that goes around the earth 100 times. Or maybe more visual, it is one grain of sand in a sandbox. So in reality, it takes a very, very small amount of this chemical to do damage. And the fact that this small amount can take a very long time to break down you can see where potential problems arise. Here are some of the crops known to be very sensitive to some of these persistent herbicides. So if you're looking to grow any of these using questionable material, you definitely want to know the source of that material or do a bioassay before growing them. Otherwise, they will be affected. Here are some interesting charts highlighting crop injury as a result of aminopyrrolid soil contamination. These studies came out of Florida. Soil residues of aminopyrrolid cause severe crop injury and plant height reduction in bell pepper, eggplant, and tomato. Plant height was reduced 30 to 40 percent as aminopyrrolid soil concentration increased from zero to one microgram. And if you're wondering what a microgram is, it's one millionth of one gram. So again, a study illustrating that it takes a very small amount of contamination to very greatly affect the growth of sensitive crops. So let's say you're worried about this chemical. Is it in my manure? Is it in the straw? Well, here's one way you could do a quick bioassay. You take clean soil that you've purchased and you fill a few pots with that clean soil. And then you take your contaminated or potentially contaminated compost or manure. You mix that 50-50 with clean soil and you fill some pots over here. This becomes your control. And then in your test soil, which is mixed with your material in question, you plant those same seeds and you let those plants grow and you compare control to test and you say, how do these look? Does this one look damaged compared to this? If you don't see damage in the test soil, you can assume that that material either wasn't there, it was in such a low concentration that it isn't affecting the plants or it's just completely broken down. So when in doubt, do a bioassay and I'll do a more specific video on bioassaying soils a little bit later on. Given all of this, I think there is a significant reason to worry or be concerned about sourcing organic matter from places of unknown origin. If you don't know how that hay was grown and what was applied to it, then you have to assume that an herbicide could be on it. Not will, but could be on it and you need to test and treat it as such. If you're sourcing manure from an unknown source, then you have to assume that there could be persistent herbicides in that manure. Again, it doesn't mean that there is, it means there could be. So I think you should worry about these things 
and then take the time to do some due diligence, talk to sources, and do some bioassays to really vet out those worries. Don't just be paranoid and scream, ah, oh, toxic compost, toxic manures, without actually knowing what you're talking about. So rather than get angry and blame somebody else, take some responsibility and do the work yourself to figure out what you're actually dealing with. So at the end of the day, while it's great to source local surplus organic matter, you have to do your due diligence up front and know what you're actually sourcing. That organic matter, what is it? Is it actually what you think it is? And what's there that maybe they're not telling you or what's there that maybe they don't even know is there? Just because it looks good doesn't mean it chemically is good. So do your due diligence, start with small quantities, test those quantities. If they prove to be safe, well then you can back up the proverbial truck. So be smart about it and you can make it work for you. For links to all the sources which I cited in this video, check out the show description below. If you have a friend that's concerned about this topic, be sure to share the video, hit the like button, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Diego, thanks for watching, and until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.